Uh, for those of you who might be new to our church over the last eight weeks, or uh, those of you who just might have forgotten, I'm Brett. <laughs> it's good to see you all this morning. Uh, I have been on sabbatical for the last eight weeks, and I just, again, want to say thank you so very much for the gift of just the time away. Uh, it, I, I'll tell you a whole lot more uh, as the fall progresses but it was just, um, it was a rest unlike I have ever had in my life. And I did not understand how much I needed it until I got about halfway through it. Uh, but it was the most restful and the most spiritually intense eight weeks that I have ever had in my life. And so again, thank you for that opportunity. My family certainly thanks you. Uh, but it is, it is great to be back home with you guys. Uh, we got to spend the summer uh, as uh, kind of honorary members of University Avenue Baptist Church in Honolulu. Uh, we have a, a friend that's on staff there. And uh, so we got to meet a lot of, of their church. And to a man, uh, when they would say, well, why are you over here? What are you doing? And I'd say, well, I'm on sabbatical. Our, our church has, has given us a time off, sent us over here. And they would say one of two things. They would either say, man, that sounds like an amazing church or man, they must love you a lot. And uh, we felt that all summer. So thank you. And that's why we were so excited to, to be back with you this morning as we look, continue to look at the book of 1 John together. Brad and I are going to be tag teaming the book of John over the next couple of weeks. Uh, when we planned sabbatical in December, we did not have on our radar that, that we would be taking Mallory to Connecticut next Sunday for uh, for, to start college. So uh, Brad will be back with you next week for First John chapter 3, but this morning uh, we're in chapter 2. There is a leadership technique, there we go, um, called the compliment sandwich. And basically what was taught for a while is, is that if you need to tell someone something critical on the job, or something they need to improve, that the best way to do it is to say something nice and then your critical statement and then something nice again, right? So we come in and say, hey, Brett, we really, uh, we really value you in our office. You add a lot. Uh, your body odor is offending your coworkers, uh, but you are a valuable member of the team, right? So some, there were, I guess there's still people that practice this technique of, of good, bad, good. But now leadership experts and psychologists uh, say this is a terrible idea. And the reason is, is that most people are wired to either hear the compliment or the negative. And so for some people, they would totally miss the criticism because all they would hear is the compliment. And for some people, they're not even ever going to hear the compliment because all they're going to hear is the thing that they need to fix. First John chapter two kind of feels like a compliment sandwich. And one of the reasons that people sometimes struggle reading it is because it's, it seems like it's saying two things at once. And it seems like in some ways they're opposites. And some of them are very, very direct. But what I want you to see this morning is that this is not a compliment sandwich, okay? That it is all one thought that John is presenting. And even though it sounds like he's saying two things, it's really just one. So let's start with 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. It says, My dear children, I write this to you so that you would not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. So when John writes the audience here in 1 John, he starts with this idea of my dear children and the, the Greek conveys a term of endearment almost like a parent to a toddler. So it's instruction and it's, it's harsh, but it's intended with love and nurturing. You know, sometimes when you've got a two-year-old, you've, you've got to be harsh. You've got to say, don't put that in the light socket, right? Because you got to get their attention. But it's not because you're trying to deprive them the joy of sticking a fork in the light socket, right? You're trying to, to nurture them to understand that that's a terrible idea. And if you're in the room today and you've never tried it, it's a terrible idea. 
Don't go home today and put a fork in the light socket and say the pastor told me to, all right? So he's saying, look, I'm about to say some things that are gonna get it all up in your kitchen, but I'm doing it because of my great love for you. And he says, I write this to you so that you will not sin. Well, immediately when we read this, we're like, wait a minute. We're not supposed to sin at all? But I do sin. Like, how do these things go together? What it says here is, I write this to you so that you will not settle for any sin in your life. Not one ounce of sin. That you won't condone it, you won't invite it, and you won't live in it. Now, will we sin? Absolutely. John's not oblivious to this. One of the, I, I listened to so, so many podcasts uh, while I was gone. And uh, there's a pastor that I'm going to reference a lot. His name is John Mark Comer. Uh, he was a pastor in uh, Portland. And I listened to him a lot. And one of the things he said when he was talking to his church was like, look, you got to understand that I'm just a person in process leading people in process. And I loved that. And that's me. Like, I, I'm just a person in process. Do I continue to sin? Of course I do. Do I have failures that I, I have regret? Yeah, absolutely. John says, I don't want you to sin. And we could read that and go, well, now I'm just out, right? Like, I know who I am. What he's saying is we cannot settle for sin. I have several pet peeves when it comes to like Christian t-shirts and Christian merchandise, but this might be my biggest one of all. It's the t-shirt or the bumper sticker or the little sign on the desk that says, I'm a Christian, but I cuss a little. Or I'm a Christian, but I drink a little. Or I'm a Christian, but whatever. Like if we know it's in scripture, that, that no unwholesome talk should come out of our mouths, right? I mean, that's what the Bible says. So how in the world would we ever say like, well, I know God says don't do that, but I do it a little bit. Like, why would we broadcast that? I, I've yet to see a bumper sticker that says, I'm a Christian, but I murder a little. I'm a Christian, but I fornicate a little, right? Because we have sin that we say, well, that is, that's, that's sin, like nobody should do that. Now this stuff over here, everybody kind of does it. And so that makes it okay. That's not what First John says. Not an ounce, not a bit. And, and certainly we should not embrace sin as okay. Now, are we forgiven? Of course we are. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. That's why this passage starts to get confusing for people because it says, well, don't sin, but if you do, you're forgiven. And so some people hear judgment. That was good timing. Judgment went dark. Some people hear judgment and they hear, oh gosh, John says I shouldn't sin and I sin all the time and so I must not be a believer. And some people hear, oh, I'm not supposed to sin, but I have an advocate. And so some people hear judgment and some people hear grace, but the reality is it goes together here. Of course, we are going to sin. And the way this is written, again, English kind of fails us sometimes, but it's written in a tense that says, if anybody does, wow, if, if anybody does sin, like isolated case, not if anybody loves sin or just wants to sin, but if anybody happens to fall into sin and it also conveys that it will happen. So the best way to translate this, and this is why it's not translated this way, would be, we know you don't want to sin, but if you happen to sin and you probably are going to sin, we have an advocate. And that you, your Bible might say counselor, it might say helper, it's a word that doesn't translate well into English. Really the best way of looking at it in the Greek is like a defense attorney. We have someone who stands before the judge and pleads our case for us. 
He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not only for ours, but also the sins of the whole world. He's not just my defense attorney, but he says, I will accept the punishment. Yes, they stand condemned, but I will take their condemnation upon myself. Now, this is the idea of substitutionary atonement. Uh, propitiation is the fancy word. And we don't have enough time to really delve into that this morning. But let me just show you what Romans 3 says. All of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. One of the best things I heard uh, this summer was, I think it was John Mark Comer again, who said, when God sees you, he sees the blood of Jesus. And when he sees Jesus, he says, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. That is an amazing thought. And that's what Romans 3 says. When God sees you, he doesn't see the guilt and shame of sin. He sees the blood of Jesus. And when he sees Jesus, he sees his child who is welcome in his family. So what John is doing here is he's expounding on what Brad talked about last week. First John 1, 8, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. So John says, look, the goal here is to be like Jesus. Are you gonna stumble in that goal? Inevitably, but we can't be okay with that. We can't settle for a life that says sin is just a part of who we are and God's okay with it. So verse three says, we know that we, come, we have come to know him if we keep his commands. The, the beautiful part of this chapter that kind of gets lost sometimes is that John actually says, you can know that you know Jesus. You can know today. He says, there is evidence in your life if you know Jesus Christ as Savior. And the first one, he says, is that we know that we know him if we keep his commands. So the, really the first is, if, if you love God, that's a part of knowing him. Whoever says, I know him, but doesn't do what he commands is a liar. And the truth is not in that person. So again, we read this sometimes and we're like, whoa. I don't know about you, but this verse can give me pause at any time I read it. Because I claim to know him, but there are times when I don't do what he says. Does that make me a liar and the truth was never in me? No, that's not what he's saying. And he's not saying the only way to be saved is works. The only way to be saved is obedience. But he is saying, we know we are saved because of our desire to obey. Salvation is evidenced by obedience and obedience helps our assurance here. And the idea of no here conveys an everyday experience, not I know everything there is to know about God, but that I wake up every day and want to know him a little bit more. So the idea here is that we want to know and keep. And keep means continually watch over something. Like a shepherd keeps his flock. That's the imagery. So in the same way that a shepherd, in the good shepherd in our case, is ever diligent about his flock and keeps an eye on them at all times, so too we should keep an eye on our knowing, our obedience. Can I ask you a hard question this morning? Are you diligent about watching over your obedience to God? Do you care? 
Do you care that your life reflects his word? Do you care when it gets out of bounds and there is conviction of sin? If you don't care, then what John says is you may be a liar. And it's really not important that if you're lying to me or to your friends or family or whatever, he's really challenging that we're lying to ourselves. If we don't care about the truth of scripture and applying it to our lives, that leads to a lack of assurance that we actually know him. And John's tone here is not to condemn. It's to inspire assurance. So you may say, yeah, I, you know what? I care about following Jesus a lot. I don't do it every time. But man, I, I want to, I desire that. Man, that is a great sign that this Holy Spirit is in you. But if you don't have any desire to follow Jesus, that may be a question that you need to ask. He says, if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. Man, I, oh gosh, you're gonna hear... <laughs> I'm just going to apologize again because I'm about to say it a third time this morning. I listened to so much this summer. Uh, and so it all pops into my head as I'm talking about this. But this idea of what it really truly means to follow Jesus, to, to walk the road with him. John says, if we truly know Jesus, we're going to li want to live the way he lived. What a challenge that is. What an opportunity. So that's one way that we can know. Verse seven. Dear friends, I am not writing you a new command, but an old one, which you have had since the beginning. This old command is the message you have heard. Yet I am writing you a new command. See, there we are again. That's why this passage confuses so many people that you just said this is an old command. Now you're saying it's a new command. Which one is it? It's both. He's saying, what I'm about to tell you is something that God has been telling you from the very beginning. But the way that you are supposed to interpret it is brand new. And it is love others. The truth is seen in him and in you because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. He's again expounding on chapter one where he said, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. Back to chapter two. Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates a brother or sister is still in the darkness. So one way that we can know that we know God is that we desire to obey his commands. A second way that we can know that we know God is that we have no hatred in our heart for someone else. He equates hatred and love with darkness and light. They are polar opposites. There is no light in darkness and there is no darkness in light. And that contrast that we understand from a physical understanding of the world is what he wants us to understand about love and hatred. That the two don't coexist. James says it this way, he says, can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? John says, just as light and dark are opposites, love and hatred are opposites. And so we're supposed to walk in the light. Back to chapter two, anyone who loves their brother and sister lives in the light and there is nothing in them to make them stumble. But anyone who hates a brother or sister is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness. They do not know where they are going because the darkness has blinded them. The Bible speaks extensively about light and dark and light is always life and love and seeing and darkness is always hate and death and danger. When we choose to hate, we are basically blinding ourselves. And we stumble in the darkness where all kinds of nasty things live. A second way that we can know that we know 
is that we have no hatred in our hearts. Finally, I'm going to jump ahead to verse 15 for time this morning. Do not love the world or anything in the world. So there's the third one. We've got do what he says. We've got love our brother and sister. And we've got don't love the world. Now, you might be saying, well, the very first memory verse everybody learns is John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, right? So if God so loved the world and I'm supposed to be like God, then why wouldn't I love the world? That's because the word love here is a different kind of love. God's love for the world is compassionate. It is seeking the benefit of others. The love for the world in John 2.15 is idolatry. It is loving the things of the world more than we love God. It's basically a divided heart. I want you to imagine that it's June 1995, and you can see um, a, a much younger, with much more hair, Brett Lester getting out of his car with his girlfriend, Joy Hudson, and they are walking along the banks of the Brazos in downtown Waco, and he's leading her up to this bench that overlooks the, the uh, suspension bridge, and he sits down, and he gets on one knee, and he says, Joy Hudson, I want you to be my wife. And it is my pledge to you that I will love you 90% of the time. (laughs) Like, I just want to be honest with you. I will love you with all of my heart 90% of the time. Now, 10% of the time, I may love other things, but 90% of the time, you're going to get my undivided love and affection. If that were the case, I would not be going to Connecticut this weekend, right? And if I would have said, look, Joy, hey, I, I love you. I want to marry you. And she said, yes, I pledge to you I would love you 90% of the time. I wouldn't have taken that deal either. Now, is it truthful that I love her 100% of the time? No. Is it truthful that she loves me 100% of the time? No. But our, that's the desire, Right? Why in the world do we think that the God of the universe is okay with 90% of our love? Why would we think the God of the universe is okay with 99% of our love? Or 99.999 whatever percent of our love? The modern church has gotten to where good enough is the standard compared to the rest of the world. And what John says is, if we have a love for the world, then we don't have a love for God. 100% devoted to him. If in our heart of hearts, we would say this morning, you know what, I mostly love God. Would that be consistent with anything that we've read this morning? If all you knew of scripture was 1 John 2 and your takeaway was, well, I mostly love God, would that give you assurance this morning? No. So what what does that look like? He says, if anyone loves the world, the love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but of the world. Fortunately for us, he defines the things that we love other than God. Right? The first is the lust of the flesh. And what I love about the way John wrote this is he didn't say, you know, everything in the world, the things you want, the things you see. No, he uses language that implies the passion and the, you know, lust is not a word that we use for desire. We use it when there's something going on that probably shouldn't be there. So he says the lust of the flesh. I was looking at one of the things I usually do when I come back to passages, just look through my notes over 20 years and see if I ever preached it before to see how I looked at it the time before. And apparently the last time I preached this passage, Mallory was two years old. So 16 years ago. And uh, she apparently was going through a phase where everything was mine. Mine. So if you went in her room to play with her, 
and you picked up one of her toys, she would yank it from your hand and say, mine. And if she went into Katie's room and Katie was playing with her toys, she would take those and say, mine, right? It didn't matter where it was. The amazing thing about a two-year-old is that you don't have to teach them the concept of possession. Like nobody ever sat down. I did not sit down with any of my kids and, at two years old and say, now these things belong to you. They are your personal property that, you know. No, we're ingrained with it. Mine. No, that's mine. And it doesn't matter if it's ours or not. If we want it and we're two years old, mine. Re remember here that John started this whole section of scripture with the term of endearment of a parent to a toddler. He says, I know that ingrained in you is a love for the shiny things of the world. That there are parts of you that just long for them and you wanna say mine, mine. Whether it's abstract like power or prestige or it's concrete like stuff. I know that's in you. So don't love the things of the world and the lusts of the flesh or the lust of the eyes because there's always something more or different or better. And we understand that the world knows this because the world has taken the lust of the eyes and used it to his advantage. Sometime when you're driving to Houston, count the number of billboards. And really look at them and see how many of them have either sex or money or power involved. Count the number of ads that you watch a day on television that are designed to draw your eye in. Whether it's a shiny new car or the brand new mop that picks up dog hair better, right? The world knows that we are creatures that are driven by our eyes, which is why they're always trying to get our attention. And if we're not careful, our eyes can lust after those things. And the last one is the pride of life. And a better translation of that, and your Bible might say this, is a boasting of what we have and what we do. It's the idea that, I can look around and go, you know what? I'm pretty good. I, house, stuff. I got, I mean, look, look at what I've accomplished. Social media is driven by the pride of life. Look what I ate today. I, I, I still don't get that one. Look what I ate today. Look where I'm on vacation. Look at how nice my kids look on the first day of school. You know what? Nobody posts a third day of school pic. <laughs> you know why? Because we're grabbing the sixth grader and we're shoving him out the door and we don't care what he's wearing and we don't care if he brushed his hair. It's basically like deodorant teeth, go. That's why nobody posts third day of school pics. We want to post the nice, shiny first day of school pics when they're wearing clothes we picked out three weeks ago. And we got them up extra early to make sure that they got a bath. It's the pride of life. Look at how good my kids look. Look at how prepared they are. Look at how, look at how, what a good parent I am for getting them so prepared for school. None of what we see on social media is, is true. We don't know that when we're looking at it, but none of it's true. We only want to post the things that we say, man, at our hearts. Man, look what we've done. And the more we feed that idea, the more we get stuck in the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes. We... We live like all of this stuff will last, even though we know it won't. And we live like the things of forever aren't really there, even though we know they are. And this isn't new. This is not a new concept. Book of Deuteronomy. 
chapter 8. When you have eaten and are satisfied, praise the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God, failing to observe his commands, his laws, and his decrees that I'm giving you this day. Otherwise, when you eat and are satisfied, when you build houses and settle down, and when your herds and flocks grow large and your silver and gold increase and all you have is multiplied, which he was saying, like, look, God is blessing you. This is what's going to happen. Then your heart will become proud and you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. He led you through the vast and dreadful wilderness, that thirsty and waterless land with its venomous snakes and scorpions. He brought you water out of the hard rock. He gave you manna to eat in the wilderness, something your ancestors had never known to humble and test you so that at the end, it might go well with you. You may say to yourself, my power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. But remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth and so confirms his covenant, which he swore to your ancestors as it is today. If you ever forget the Lord your God and follow other gods, lowercase g, and worship and bow down to them, I testify against you that today you will surely be destroyed. Nothing has changed people entering the promised land were susceptible to thinking, look what I've done. Just like we are today. And verse 19 is still there. If we love the world, we will be destroyed like the nations the Lord destroyed before you, so you will be destroyed for not obeying the Lord your God. These are people that had just gotten out of the wilderness. Like they're actually still in the wilderness in Deuteronomy. Like they're still wandering toward the promised land. And before they even get there, God says, be careful. Be careful. Don't fall in love with the blessings more than you love the one who blesses. It's a difficult passage of scripture. It's hard to read and understand. So let's just make it really clear. Don't settle for any sin in your life. Love God and love him by doing what he says. Love God and love him by loving others. Love God and love him only and not serve the world. This is not a compliment sandwich. This is one clear thought. Love your Lord, the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength. 